happening. Okay, so what have we done so far in this class on signals and systems? So we started with the definition of signals and with the definition of systems. And in particular, we considered a very small class of systems called linear time invariant systems. And we studied their properties in one of the first few lectures. Then after that, we said there are two types of signals that we largely have concentrated on in the entire class. And those are complex exponential signals. Uh, let me write it. This is a review. And so we did complex exponential signals. We talked about it for quite some time in the first few lectures. Okay. Then we said that, hey, let's talk about periodic signals. And we realized that periodic signals can be written as some of complex exponential signals. Okay, and this is this whole field was called Fourier series. This led to the study of Fourier series. Then we said, hey, not all signals are periodic. There are a lot of signals that are aperiodic. And then we said, oh, well, aperiodic signals are periodic signals with periodicity infinity. Okay, so these are signals with infinite period. I mean, I can keep repeating the same aperiodic signal again and again after the infinite time interval. And that led us to the development of Fourier transform. Then we realize that we have understood the signal space very well. We have understood periodic signals. We have understood aperiodic signals. We have understood Fourier series. We have understood Fourier transform. Then we said, let's go back to systems and let's talk about LTI systems. And we talked about frequency response of LTI systems. Okay, and the key equation here is H of J omega equals to H of T e raised to minus J omega T dt. So that's the frequency response of LDI system. And we, we did used body plot to understand the frequency response of LDI system. So use body plots to determine filtering characteristics. What's wrong? So some systems block low frequency noises, low frequency signals, some systems block high frequency signals, some pass a block of signals and, and filter out other parts of the frequency space. And we studied all of that using Bode plots. And then we also understood some fundamental coupling between the frequencies that a system responds to or system blocks and how does that affect the time characteristic of uh, impulse response and the step response? In particular, 
in the first order systems case, we realize that if a system passes higher number of frequencies, then it responds to a step input very, very quickly. On the other hand, if a system blocks a lot of high frequencies, then the step response is very sluggish. Okay, so that's something we studied for in the context of LTI systems and in the con context of first order and second order LTI systems. Okay, so there is, was a coupling. One of the key ideas we developed was there is a coupling between frequency characteristics characteristics and time domain responses in LTI systems. So what you see in frequency domain also affects the time domain. So you can't have the best of both worlds. As soon as you constrain the time domain properties, you have also constrained the frequency characteristics of that system. And so there is some sort of impossibility result. If you want a system that is low pass, blocks high frequency signals, but responds very quickly to inputs, it's just not possible, okay? It's just physically not possible to build such a system. So we studied some of that stuff um, in, in, in uh, one of the, I think somewhere around lecture 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay. And then that led us to talk about integration of digital and analog signals uh, systems using uh, analog to digital and digital to analog conversions. And the key idea here is that a lot of newer systems are designed in such a way that the digital component can communicate uh, with an outer, uh, like it can, be it can be connected to the internet. And so you can keep upgrading the software in order to make the systems better and better over time. So it always pays to transform all the analog signals to digital signals, uh, do a lot of processing in the digital domain using computers and sophisticated softwares, and then transform the output signal of that uh, digital, after processing it digitally, whatever is the output signal, you can then transform it into analog signals and then run the entire system in the, in the time domain. And so that, that entire idea was actually very useful. And in fact, a lot of newer innovations are happening. Uh, not, I mean, it's not new, it's been happening for like 30, 40 years since the advent of computers. But, uh, but a lot of newer innovations are happening in that particular situation. So what, how, do you, how do you process the digital signals? And I think Zoom is a great example of that, where my voice is being converted into digital signal bits, zeros and ones. And then Zoom software is doing some processing to remove all the background noise. Maybe there is an air conditioning noise. Maybe there are other sources of noise inside the, inside the room. So Zoom is processing those noises. It's filtering out all those noises from my voice. And, so, and, and then it presents it to you at your computer and your software system converts that digital signal to analog signal, sends it to the speaker. And then the speaker responds appropriately and you see a very clear voice um, and, and you don't hear any of the background noises that I'm hearing in my room. And then, We now move on to the Laplace transform and Z transform. So Laplace transform for time domain signals and Z transform for um, uh, discrete time signals. So Laplace transform for continuous time signals and Z transform for discrete time signals. And I know some of you are big fan of Laplace and Z transform and not a big fan of um, frequency, uh, Fourier transform. So we are going to study the Laplace and Z transform now. Any questions so far? This is a quick recap of the key things we have done in this class. And now I'm going to talk about why Laplace and Z transform are important. 
questions okay let's talk about laplace transform so suppose i have a system this is my system and if you compute the impulse response y of t is going to be e raised to t ut. That's the impulse response of this LTI system. Now, of course, right now I'm just, uh, uh, by solving the differential equation, I can get this as the impulse response of the system. Um, you can't really use the Fourier transform uh, approach that we have developed so far to come up with this, this uh, expression. Uh, can someone tell me why we cannot apply Fourier transform in this case? This was part of your quiz three question. Um, it doesn't. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Okay. It doesn't uh, follow their Dirichlet conditions. Yeah. Right? right. So E raised to T is not integrable. Uh, Natalie, you had anything else to say, or this was your response? Yeah, I was going to say the Dirichlet conditions. Right. Not satisfied. So E raised to T UT does not satisfy. Dirichlet's conditions. In particular, e raised to t ut dt from minus infinity to infinity is actually infinity because e raised to t is growing exponential. So it goes all the way to infinity. So if you integrate this whole thing, it will go to infinity. Because it does not satisfy Dirichlet's condition, it's quite likely that it doesn't have a Fourier transform. Because for Fourier transform to exist, you want the system to be integrable. Otherwise, it has infinite energy. And if a signal has infinite energy, you can't uh, come up with the Fourier transform. You can't uh, determine the Fourier transform of such a signal. So this, this makes us, uh, so this is a problem. So we developed this whole set of uh, uh, mathematical base only to realize that unstable systems, so these are unstable systems, that unstable systems cannot be analyzed using this Fourier transform approach that we have developed so far. Now, we know from our practical experience, we saw this example of Tacoma Narrow Bridge, which uh, oscillated violently and then, uh, uh, which was a, exponentially growing complex signal. So it was, if you look at the amplitude of the bridge, it was, it was swaying and then it was swaying more and then it was uh, oscillating with even higher amplitude until it broke down, it completely collapsed. And that was back in 1940s. So we know from our experience that there are reactions or there are processes that are unstable, that are inherently unstable and in those processes, something breaks, snaps, explodes, or something like that happens. So th th that's why they are unstable system. And we definitely want to be able to come up with a mathematical machinery that can be applied to unstable systems as well, not just for stable systems, because in reality, we will have situations which are combination of stable and unstable systems. And we would like to have a coherent mathematical framework to study all of these systems together. Okay, so that's the background why Laplace transform is important. And that's what Laplace came up with. That's what his main contribution, one of his contributions was. Now, let's consider the signal x of t equals to e raised to t ut. So as we just saw, it violates Dirichlet's condition and therefore it does not have a Fourier transform. Now, 
now can someone come up with a method by which i can transform this signal to something else let's say x tilde t which is a decaying exponential so that i can take the fourier transform of that system that signal sorry so i want a decaying exponential here i have a growing exponential i want to transform that signal in a way that i get a decaying exponential what are the thoughts what are possible ideas we could try it has to be a bijective map so however way i want to transform the signal i want to be able to recover x of t back without any problem really quickly could you say what the tilde above the x means again i mean i'm just going to transform the signal so x of t is my original signal it's a growing exponential so i can't take the fourier transform i can only take a fourier transform of decaying exponential uh, what i mean is what the symbol why are you putting a, a symbol over the x of t the the tilde is that just to show, show that there was a transform that happened uh yeah so this is the transformed version of x of t okay thank you yeah yeah i'm just using distinct symbols uh, so as to make it clear what they mean could you take x of t to the negative 1 power okay so one one idea is i define x tilde equals to 1 over x okay this will make it decaying exponential what else and this is also invertible the problem is x of t could become zero right so x of t is zero before time t for, for time t less than zero so this is undefined for t less than zero so it creates a problem anything else how about multiplication so this is inversion inversion creates a problem what about multiplication with some other signal <clears throat> uh this one might be cheeky but multiplied by e to the negative 2t okay e raised to negative 2t times x of t yeah i think this should work so then i get x tilde t is e raised to negative t ut and now i can take the fourier transform of x tilde t now if i want to recover x of t i need to remember this e raised to 2t term that i have multiplied to and so i should be able to recover x of t back because e raised to negative 2t can get multiplied to x tilde of t and i will get x of t t x of t as e raised to 2t x tilde of t okay so this seems to be a nice uh, uh idea so i multiply it by exponentially decaying term and it creates a bijective map between x of t and x tilde of t and x tilde of t is a decaying exponential therefore i can take the fourier transform of x tilde of t okay this seems to be a good idea and this is the idea that laplace had and he came up with this new transform which is laplace transform okay so in laplace transform is given by the fourier transform of e raised to minus sigma t times xt so i have an exponentially decaying term that i multiply to xt and then i take the fourier transform of that now of course there are some specific values of sigma that you need to pick in order to make sure that the fourier transform exists and that would be studied under the umbrella of region of convergence that we will get to very soon 
Okay, so this is the key idea of Laplace transform. I'm going to multiply the signal by an exponentially decaying term. It need not always be decaying. It could also be growing. But, uh, uh, but for the time being, let's just consider that sigma is positive. So it's an exponentially decaying signal. I'll multiply x of t with an exponentially decaying signal. And I'll take the Fourier transform and that defines the Laplace transform of the signal. So this is, this is the first idea I wanted to introduce in today's lecture. <clears throat> now I want to introduce the second, I, I want to recall a second idea, which is as follows. Suppose we have a exponential signal e raised to st where s is a s is a complex number and i pass it through an lti system anyone remembers what the output of such a what is the output of this system when i input it with an exponential signal let me go back to lecture Yeah, lecture 10. So in lecture 10, we had discussed about this fact that when you have e raised to st as a input to an LTI system, the output is going to be h of s multiplied by e raised to st. And we had introduced this concept of eigenvalue and eigenfunction. So e raised to st is an eigenfunction of the LTI system. And h of s is the eigenvalue of the LTI system. Everyone remember, I mean, I know it's been a long while since we had discussed this in lecture 10, but now I want to recall this concept from lecture 10. We had this whole lecture on this particular concept of eigenvalue and eigenfunction. So let's recall that again in lecture 30, and the output is h of s multiplied by e raised to st. Now h of s, is given by H of T, which is the impulse response, e raised to negative ST dt. Now here S is any complex number. Now I can write a complex number S as sigma plus J omega. So this is the real part. So sigma is the real part of S. Omega is the imaginary part of S. Then I have H of S as integral H of T e raised to minus sigma T times e raised to minus J omega T dt. What is this equal to? This is Fourier transform of something. What is that something? Was it just that exponential times the x of t thing? Yeah, h of t, yeah. So this is h of t times e raised to minus sigma t. This is a Fourier transform of this particular signal. So again, we are seeing the same thing happening again. So we saw that in the context of Laplace transform, um, going back to the previous slide, we were multiplying x of t with e raised to negative sigma t. 
and we called it a Laplace transform of xt. And we have seen this, this issue arising in an earlier uh, lecture in lecture 10, where h of s was essentially a Laplace transform of h of t. <clears throat> okay, and this is how we are going to define the Laplace transform. And these two ideas, how Laplace defined the Laplace transform and the fact that this e raised to st is an eigenfunction for an LTI system, these two ideas would allow us to extend the, uh, all the theory we have studied so far for Fourier transform to a much more general setting of stable and unstable systems, <clears throat> which creates a coherent framework to analyze any combination of LTI systems. It doesn't matter whether they are stable or unstable because you can take the Laplace transform for any type of systems. LTI systems, it doesn't necessarily have to be stable. Okay, any questions so far before we jump on to the formal definition of Laplace transform? Okay. So you can think of Laplace transform as a generalization of Fourier transform. And we define it as X of S is equal to the Fourier transform of X T E raised to minus Sigma T, which is integral minus infinity to infinity. And the notation would be X of T L X of S. Okay. Now I need to, so remember whenever we do a transform, we have mapped the signal, original signal, which is a function of time to a function over a complex, uh, the space of complex numbers. Now we need to be able to go back from the space of complex, a function from in over the space of complex numbers back to a time domain signal, which would be the inverse Laplace transform. And that would be done in the following way. So we know that X of S is sigma plus j omega, and it is the Fourier transform of e raised to minus sigma t x of t. Now I can write it in the following way. I want to come up, I want to do the inverse Fourier transform of this X of S or X of Sigma plus J Omega. 
I will get e raised to minus sigma t x t equals to the inverse Fourier transform of x sigma plus j omega. And this is given by integral one over two pi d omega. <clears throat> so sigma seems to be fixed on both sides of the equation. So let me put e raised to minus sigma t on the other side. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll pause here for a second so you can stare at this equation and then we'll proceed in 20 seconds. So I'm going to write x of t as one over two pi e raised to sigma t integral x sigma plus j omega e raised to j omega t d omega. Now this integration is with respect to omega. So sig e raised to sigma t, it's not a function of omega. So I can push this inside the integral without any problem. So I have one over two pi integral x sigma plus j omega e raised to sigma plus j omega t d omega. Okay, so I see sigma plus j omega on two places, two, two, two spots. And I know that sigma plus j omega is s. So I'm going to make the change sigma minus j infinity And this is the expression for inverse Fourier transform. Okay, so the expressions for inverse Fourier transform is slightly more complicated in comparison to the inverse Fourier transform. In particular, in the inverse Fourier transform, the limits of the integral was minus infinity to plus infinity, and it was integrated with respect to omega, as is the case in this particular equation. But in the case of inverse Laplace transform, you are essentially doing the integration along a line which is parallel to the imaginary axis and you are uh, integrating the entire signal multiplied by e raised to st ds. So what is the sigma minus j omega j infinity to sigma plus j infinity? So if this is my Laplace domain, this is my imaginary part of s, this is my real part of s, then, and this is my origin. What I'm doing is I'm doing the integration, this is sigma, and this is sigma minus j infinity, this is sigma plus j infinity. So I'm doing the integration all the way from minus infinity, sigma minus j infinity to sigma plus j infinity of x of s multiplied by e raised to st. That's the inverse Laplace transform.
okay there are a few important things we need to remember for the laplace transform so the first thing that we will talk about shortly is the fact that the sigma cannot be arbitrary the sigma has to be within a specific region otherwise we'll get absurd answer from taking the inverse laplace transform or for taking the laplace transform okay so that's number one thing that we will study the second thing we will study or we will show through several examples that if we have complex exponential signals so if x of t is complex exponential then capital x of x uh, capital capital x of s which is the laplace transform is going to be a rational function of s okay and all of this is stuff that we have already seen except that we replaced s with j omega in all our expressions earlier but now we are being a bit more general so instead of writing j omega we'll just write s in in the place of j omega in most situations okay so let's do some examples is everything clear so far so the whole methodology is clear how we came from fourier transform to laplace transform any questions okay examples let's pick our favorite complex exponential signal e raised to at ut now if if it were a fourier transform class i would have said that a is negative but because we are talking about laplace transform i don't care what the value of a is it could be a growing exponential it could be a decaying exponential i just don't care okay i can compute the fourier transform of the signal okay uh dt which is equal to 0 to infinity e raised to a plus s t dt wouldn't it be uh, a minus s oh yeah of course thanks a minus s t dt let me break up s into a minus sigma minus j omega t dt when would when would i be able to compute the integral of this okay let me let me break it further e raised to a minus sigma t e raised to minus j omega t dt okay now when is this integral so remember whenever you are computing the integral it has to be absolutely integrable because when it is absolutely integrable then you can compute there is a hope of computing an integration or computing the fourier transform of that signal so for what values of sigma would this be absolutely integrable let me just write it in words so question for what values of sigma would the integral be well defined i have an answer in the chat box sigma larger than 8 perfect so this is only going to be true 
answer is sigma larger than a. So when sigma is larger than a, then a minus sigma is negative. So this, this part of the signal is decaying exponential. And this is of course the absolute value of this is equal to one. So this wouldn't participate in the absolutely integrable part. And this is a decaying exponential, so it's absolutely integrable. Okay, so sigma larger than A is the region, or in other words, I can write it as real part of S must be larger than A. In that region, this integral is well-defined and now the only thing we need to figure out is what's the value of that integral. So let's do that calculation. And I'm just going to go back to e raised to a minus st dt. This goes from minus infinity to infinity, and I'm going to restrict myself to real of S is greater than A. So this integration is well-defined. Now, what's the integral of a complex, sorry, of an exponential signal? Well, it's E raised to A minus S over A minus S. Minus infinity, oh. There has to, oh, there, this is zero, sorry. Zero to infinity. And this is equal to one over S minus A. Okay, so this is my Fourier transform. Sorry, not Fourier transform, Laplace transform. Um, now, there are two things that I want to emphasize here. The first thing to emphasize is the fact that there are some specific values of S for which the integral is well defined. And this is known as the region of convergence, ROC. And we'll just talk about it very quickly in the next slide. And then the second important thing that I want you to notice is if the signal, if the original signal is an exponential signal, then my Laplace transform is a rational, it's, it's in the form of PS over QS. So the first thing is, Laplace transform is defined over a specific region in the complex plane and the second thing is if xt is complex exponential, then x of s is a rational function of s. So x of s is written as p of s over Q of S, where P and Q are polynomials of S.
Okay, two things that we notice from looking at this particular example. So let's talk about the first concept, which is the region of convergence. So in Fourier transform, we didn't have to worry about the region of convergence. As long as Dirichlet's conditions are satisfied by the signal, we know that a Fourier transform would exist and therefore we could just compute the Fourier transform directly. We didn't have to worry about all this Sigma business. But now in Laplace transform, we have to be worried about it because there are regions in the space. If you pick a specific value of S, then that integral is may not be well defined. And therefore there is no point of talking about Laplace transform of the signal at that particular point S. Okay, so the region of convergence ROC is defined as the set of S for which x of s equals to xt e raised to minus st dt is well defined. Okay. Let's look at the second example, keeping this in mind. And I guess after this example, the class will be over because we don't have much time. So now my signal is X of T is E raised to negative T U minus T. So now this is a signal that's uh, negative all the way up to time zero and after that it's equal to zero. Let's try to define my X of S that is E raised negative E raised to minus A T U minus T E raised to minus Sigma T e raised to minus j omega t dt. A lot of different exponential terms. So the first thing I want to do is eliminate u of negative t. And I can do that by setting the limits of the integral from minus infinity to zero because u of minus t is equal to one in this region and then u of minus t equals to zero for t positive. So in order for this to, this integral to make sense, oh, I probably also want to change the, the variable t. So let me make t equals to minus tau. And so dt equals to minus d tau. And so I have negative infinity to zero e raised to a plus sigma tau e raised to j omega tau minus d tau and so i can write it as 0 to infinity e raised to a plus sigma tau
Now, in what region is this convergent? When is this integral well defined? For uh, sigma greater than negative a. Right, a plus sigma should be less than zero. Then this means sigma is less than negative a. Did you say greater than or less than? The correct one. Okay. All right, so sigma should be less than negative a. And if this is the condition satisfied, then this integral is well-defined. And in this region of convergence, you can show that x of s is given by one over s plus a. But the region of convergence, real value, real part of s must be less than negative a. After doing all the computation. So this was my second example where we showed explicitly what the region of convergence looks like for different types of complex exponential signals or even real exponential signals. So we'll continue with several examples in the next class and talk about region of convergence of various different signals. And then we'll jump on to uh, some properties of region of convergence for Laplace transform. Thank you for your attention. I'll see you guys on Wednesday.